Thanks. Very good. Well, welcome everybody to one more uh, webinar in the the uh, series of webinars brought to you by the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. Today we will feature speakers and discussion on the topic of fostering open policies on your campus and beyond. My name is James Gloppet Grossclag. I'm a dean with College of the Canyons and also uh, have the honor of serving as president of the advisory board for the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. And I'll be your moderator today. So again, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to uh, bring you really, uh, really interesting perspectives and discussion on fostering open policies on your campus and beyond. A uh, quick reminder for those of you uh, who know Blackboard Collaborate or new information for those of you who don't know Blackboard Collaborate, uh, uh, some of the controls here on the left-hand side of your screen. You'll see the audio and video controls if you are using a camera or, uh, uh, or headset. Uh, to the immediate left of the screen, you'll see a list of all the participants. You can scroll up and down there to see who's here. And then towards the lower left, you see the chat function, and you can exchange uh, chat messages as we move along. Uh, please feel free to post questions there or comments or links as, uh, as appropriate. Uh, Una Daly, Community College Outreach Manager for the Open Courseware Consortium, is monitoring the chat, and she'll help uh, address questions along the way. And uh, towards the end, we'll have, uh, have time for uh, our, our presenters to answer those questions. Uh, today, uh, we have these three fine speakers. Um, Quill West from Tacoma, Tacoma Community College, and Paul Stacy from Creative Commons, and Lisa Young from the Maricopa Community College District. Uh, would each of you take a, just a quick second to introduce yourselves, please? Hi, this is Quill West. I am the OER Project Director at Tacoma Community College, and I was a librarian on the Open Course Library Project from Washington State. Um, so I've been working with Open Education Resources for, I think it counts as five years now, um, and I'm just really passionate about making sure that OER policy fits our practice. Great. Thank you. Paul? Hi, I'm Paul Stacy, Associate Director of Global Learning for Creative Commons. It's great to be here. I was uh, prior to Creative Commons in charge of an open education resource initiative in British Columbia, Canada that received Ministry of Advanced Education funding for nine consecutive years starting in 2003. So I had a lot of experience actually working with government around policy and also working with institutions and faculty uh, with regard to policy around requirements associated with developing OER. Great. Thank you, Paul. And Lisa? Good afternoon. Um, I'm Lisa Young from Scottsdale Community College within the Maricopa Community College District. And I started out teaching hydrology and looking into reusable learning objects. And I was so excited about that that it just kind of rolled right into open educational resources. I'm currently co-chairing our steering team at the Maricopa Community Colleges working on developing policy and increasing adoption of OER. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And, and Lisa, uh, Quick question. Is it true that the Maricopa Community College District is the largest community college district in the U.S.? We tend to go back and forth. Um, I don't know about today, but generally it's where one or two. Very good. I think that's, that's important to keep in mind as you, as you share your project there, that we're, we're, we're talking about a very significant institution. So great. Thank you very much. And uh, anyone who's just joining us, please take a minute to introduce yourselves in the chat window. Our agenda for today is pretty straightforward. I'll talk uh, very briefly about CCC OER. Uh, also, I'll plant a few seeds about the importance of open policies. And then we'll dive right into the meat of the day. Uh, uh, Paul will talk about Creative Commons and share some open case studies. Uh, Lisa will talk about the Maricopa Community College District open policy. And then Quill will talk about a student-funded project at Tacoma Community College. And again, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. But in the meantime, please feel free to ask questions or post links and observations in the chat window. And Una Daly will be monitoring the chat window. So without further ado, let me remind you all of the uh, mission of the CCC OER, or Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. We are here to promote the adoption of OER to enhance teaching and learning. 
uh, as the voice of community colleges within the global open education movement. Uh, we work to expand access to education, we support professional development, and generally we advance the community college mission. Uh, and we're so pleased to be, I know I speak for Una and myself when we say when I say we're so pleased to be part of this. It's so easy to do uh, the kind of outreach work that we do because there's so much great work going on on individual campuses across the United States and Canada. Uh, you can see here a representation of our members, over 200 colleges across 15 states and provinces. We'd love to fill in the middle of the map a little bit more. Uh, we're excited to see uh, folks from Pennsylvania here today. That's not really the middle of the map, but that might help us a little bit to get a few more dots on that map. Um, uh, now moving into the topic of open policy, we, I've put up here just a couple of, couple of uh, observations for myself as uh, a, a local community college manager as to why uh, policy is important around openness. Uh, uh, it's, it's important for me to be able to point to the way in which OER aligns with my institution's mission. Uh, that helps me in all kinds of ways. Uh, a conversation that comes up quite often is uh, faculty incentives to adopt OER. Do I make it up as I go along? If I have a grant this, this year, I give somebody a few dollars to help out, and next year I don't have a grant, so there's, there's no, no incentive. Uh, what role can policy play uh, to level the playing field there? And then depending on the type of institution you're at, uh, what role could work in OER uh, play in tenure and promotion? Uh, moving down to the bottom right corner, you'll see a, a note about the student role in OER policy and practice. Uh, for many of us, I think, in the community colleges, the whole reason we're in this uh, endeavor uh, of open, promoting open education is to benefit our students. So what role can students play in, in formulating open policy and implementing open policy? And finally, uh, always a fun topic, uh, is the, that of uh, labor agreements, uh, collective bargaining agreements, and intellectual property uh, agreements. Uh, once someone creates content, to whom does it belong? How do you properly cite it? Uh, how do you make it discoverable? And so on. So uh, open policies or policies that are designed around openness or with openness in mind can help address many of these questions that become real sticking points on the ground. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I know uh, Paul Stacy will address some of these or help us begin thinking about some of these questions. So Paul, please take it away. Thanks, James. Yeah, and in my introduction, I commented on my work with BC Campus, but now at Creative Commons, of course, we are looking at education globally. And so from an open policy point of view, I thought I'd focus my remarks on the end beyond part of today's uh, topic. So let me set the stage by first referencing some big picture context around open policies. I would say that the Cape Town Open Education Declaration, which, which was uh, signed or created in 2007, really kind of started the ball rolling by, by establishing not only a set of principles, but a call for policy around OER. And then last year in 2012, we saw UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning do a survey on government's OER policies around the world. They looked at Africa, the Arab states, Asia and the Pacific, Europe and North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And they basically examined the extent to which policies were already in place. So I encourage you to have a look at that if that's something that you're interested. And Creative Commons um, created an OER policy registry. So we actually have aggregated over 80 policies around uh, the world from around the world dealing with open education resources. And in June last year there was the UNESCO 2012 Paris OER Declaration which, which really established a universal agreement among all countries to pursue OER within education. Now it's a set of guidelines and recommendations as opposed to a mandate, but it's, it's interesting to see how the uh, recommendations have been playing out going forward. I also wanted to mention that when we think about or talk about policy, it's worth realizing that policy could be put in place at many different levels. You know, we can have regional or global re or regional policy, policy at a national level or a state or province level. 
policy at a municipal or city or town level, and then policy at an institution, departmental, or even personal level. So there's all these kind of places where policy can come into play. Most of my remarks will focus on policy that is at a state, province, or government level and or an institutional level. But I wanted to first suggest that or give an example of a regional one. This is an initiative that Creative Commons has been um, fortunate enough to support. There is an OER policy initiative going on in Europe where um, Alec Tarkowski, who is part of Creative Commons Poland, our affiliate there, has been working with others across Europe to essentially establish a common framework for ensuring that opportunities for open policy adoption in, the, in, in Europe are, are kind of realized. That the focus there is primarily on K-12, but they are very much looking to build a community across Europe of OER policy advocates. And it's this kind of development where we're looking to ensure that those people who have an interest in open policy have an opportunity to connect with others and learn from others that I think is really great about this initiative. And, and I put a link here at the bottom of that slide if you'd like to learn more about the work being done in Europe. The main document though that I wanted to share with everyone today is, is this document which got written um, by a team from UNESCO in follow-up to the Paris OER Declaration. And this document is essentially a template that is intended to help everyone who is trying to create OER policy figure out what areas within their organization uh, might be suitable for policy, and then to actually, it actually incorporates specific wording from different OER policies around the world to, to kind of give you some examples that you might be able to draw on. These are the eight areas that they identify in this document where OER policy could, could play a role. I won't cover all eight today, but I wanted to cover some of them just to give you a, a sampling, a taste test of some of the OER policy. I'm also going to use actual wording. So you'll see my slides are a little bit text heavy, but, but clearly when it comes to policy, what we're really needing to do is to translate principles and concepts into actual wording that gets incorporated in written documents that reflect that policy. So you'll see that, um, that I actually have included some of that wording. So let me deal with the first one around intellectual property, copyright, and licensing. Most of the OER policies in this area are primarily looking to get work that is being done using public funds by public institutions or staff at public institutions, the creation of education materials to get those shared under an open license. The basic idea is that public funds should result in a public good and that the benefits that are accrued from this in eliminate unnecessary duplication of, of public spending. And the big thrust here around this policy, and I think this is perhaps the, the most common policy approach that gets taken, is that sharing should be the default expectation, not the exception. So, so setting the default to open is what uh, Cable and my other colleagues at Creative Commons and I talk about. An interesting area that is still kind of, I would say, in its early stages, and I'm looking forward to hearing Quill talk about the student uh, side of things, but, but when it comes to student work, if we're looking to incorporate and make use of student work in our teaching and learning, then clearly we also need to address the IP and copyright and licensing aspects of student work, not just teacher and faculty work. So that's, a, that's an interesting area that um, that I'm just starting to see some OER policy emerge around. There's some real, really, really great examples of this uh, rolling out across the U.S. at this point in time. Many of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with the Department of Labor TACT program. Uh, this is a large OER initiative, $2 billion over four years. And in the actual uh, call for proposals from the Department of Labor, they specify that everything that is newly developed by the community colleges using grant funds must be licensed with a Creative Commons CC BY license. In fact, here's some of the specific language, and, and I, I realize I don't want to read all this out loud, but I wanted to give you a flavor for how policy translates into written language. So, 
So these are word-for-word uh, -word lifted right out of the call for proposals. And you can see that, um, that the Department of Labor is specifying that grantees have to license newly developed materials with a Creative Commons CC BY license. And they also specify why. So you know, it allows other users to copy, distribute, transmit, and adapt the copyrighted work as long as they give attribution to the original creator. And that the whole purpose is to ensure that materials developed with these funds result in work that can be freely reused and improved by others. And, and that really is an inherent principle underlying all of our OER work. They also go on to clarify that it's not just new content that is being created with grant funds that have to be licensed CC BY, but even if you're modifying existing content and adapting and improving it using grant funds, that too also needs to be licensed with a Creative Commons license. But they, but they clarify that not, you know, if you use some funds to purchase copyrighted material or licensed material from a publisher or from a third party, uh, that clearly that material will be subject to the terms of your license agreement with the provider and does not have to be licensed with a Creative Commons license. And then finally, in the uh, third round of the call for proposals from the Department of Labor, they added some language about open file formats um, requiring grantees to develop their curriculum in open file formats and around if funds are used to create software requiring it to be licensed using a, a free software or open source software license. So they actually have broadened the open requirements associated with their grant to encompass these additional components. So that's one area around intellectual property and copyright and, and the requirements uh, or the language in terms of policy that can be put in place to support open education resources. Another area around um, OER where some policy can be really useful is just in terms of the actual curriculum design and materials development process. And the basics of this policy are that materials should first be sourced from open content. So rather than starting to author um, new material, first have a look at what's out there and see if there's some open education resources available. It's basically an adopt first kind of mantra with adaptation second and creating third only if you can't adopt or adapt. So um, in this area, I think that one of the things that we're looking to try to do is to take advantage of alternative resources that already exist and remove the cost because it can be quite timely to get copyright clearance when you're trying to use someone else's material. But it's this last point on the slide that I think is really some critical language that might be uh, incorporated into OER policies in a positive way. And that is that one of the strategies that we're looking to implement here is to in create an open community of practice that engages faculty across a whole system or within an institution or across multiple institutions in ongoing quality improvement and quality assurance. It's interesting to see that when um, curriculum gets put out as OER, it gets subject to a kind of peer review that uh, sometimes uh, curriculum that that's behind a password protected learning management system never gets uh, subjected to. And there's some great examples of this also happening. Um, I mentioned that I worked at BC Campus prior to joining Creative Commons, and, and the open work that they're doing continues on. The Ministry of Advanced Education uh, funded the work that I was doing around OER for nine consecutive years and has continued with an additional two years of funding. So this is public funds going into creation of open education resources. And they have policy now in place that is looking to support uh, the development of open textbooks or the adoption of open textbooks. So um, I think the approach that's being taken here in British Columbia around first finding existing open textbooks and using those if at all possible. Second, looking at them and if they're not perfect, you found something that's 70 or 80 percent there, adapting it and modifying it. And then only as a last resource, resource um, kind of creating new textbooks if, if you can't find an existing one. Actually, the, the BC government just uh, put forward an additional, they initially funded 40 open textbooks for the highest enrolled courses across their post 
post-secondary system and now have added fund an additional round of funding for further 20 books that will be um, used to support not only the standard academic areas but the vocational areas as well. And there are other great examples. So um, the solar initiative is where all of the OER that I was part of um, supporting here in British Columbia got put. And then um, uh, Quill mentioned the Open Course Library Initiative in Washington. These are some other uh, specific examples of policy. I like that the Open Course Library one in terms of its policy and, and focus on supporting the development of the top 81 courses across their system and challenging the developers to create the curriculum material and the textbook for under $30. So there's some real interesting spins that we can put on the requirements associated with creating curriculum. Those two I think are the most common um, topics around OER policies, but I wanted to mention just a few more. On the human resource side, this is a really critical part that uh, James had mentioned in his remarks. And, um, and so one is associated with including OER development in job descriptions and, and ensuring that OER produced by faculty counts in terms of their career advancement and their performance assessment. And, and there are some policies that are now shaping the wording around this to suggest that OER development should be recognized and be given similar kind of credit in performance assessment as peer-reviewed publications, which I think is a very constructive direction. And, and clearly we have to support faculty and others within institutions in terms of allocating time for them to create OER. File formats I mentioned earlier in terms of the TACT program, but basically what we're trying to sh ensure with policy wording around file formats is that any content that gets developed be put out in a format that allows it to be not only sort of found and be indexable by search engines, but to be able to directly edit that content. So it's really helpful to include in the OER policies that we're putting out some requests or requirements associated with making the content available in open file formats that allow other users to edit and modify and adapt that content. And, and, you, and, um, and you can see some language at the bottom of this slide around the, the source code component of creating software in the TACT program. I just want to conclude by saying um, this whole movement towards creating and authoring open policy, and, and you can see I've only touched on a few of the categories that are covered in that UNESCO template document. If you're interested in the full spectrum, I encourage you to check it out. But there's a growing awareness of the importance of policy. There's a lot of OER development that has happened from the grassroots level, and now with policy what we're trying to put in place is a kind of overarching framework or umbrella that allows and provides support for that grassroots development. So Creative Commons recognizing this need is uh, just launching an open policy network. This will be intentionally created to support those that are trying to author and develop open policies and bring together those advocates and organizations and policymakers who are working in that arena to support them with example talking points, how to deal with the uh, opposition, particular uh, examples of open policy from around the world that they can model their policies on. And this is a really exciting new development for us. Very good. Thank you, Paul. And thank you very much. That's great information, and you can see that there's a lot of a lot of uh, information out there, and a, and a lot of a lot of points of reference uh, uh, of work that's been done around the world. And if you're you're at an institute, a local institution, you're just thinking about getting started. It's, I, at least in my case, I find I found it very helpful to be able to point to uh, UNESCO and and different kinds of larger organizations that have done work in this area. Uh, prime amongst them, Creative Commons. So thanks to Paul and thanks to Creative Commons for all the great work they're doing uh, to pave the way for the rest of us. Uh, moving on then to Lisa, we're going to see an example. Lisa is going to tell us about an example of a large uh, community college uh, putting into place some of these elements. So Lisa, please. Thanks, James. Um, one of the things that James mentioned earlier is that 
sometimes we're the largest community college district in the nation, and sometimes we're number two. Um, but we're just getting started on our um, open educational resources initiative called the Maricopa Millions. But we're making pretty good progress, and we're very excited about what this could lead to. So just to start out a little bit about the Maricopa Community Colleges, we are 10 colleges that are individually accredited. We have 37 associate degrees, over 10,000 courses, we have over 265,000 students, and nearly 10,000 employees. And so um, Paul Golish and I, who are um, leading this project here at Maricopa, are starting out with five courses that we're really targeting. And we think, oh my gosh, 10,000 courses we have. And we're starting with five, but it's just a one thing at a, at a time. And we're hoping that it will really ramp up. So like a lot of others who are moving into open educational resources, we have concerns about removing, removing those barriers for students um, in order to achieve their education. And we believe that learning starts on day one, and we want our students to have the learning materials that they need on day one, regardless of without cost barriers um, or not having access, not being able to get to the bookstore, what have you. And so I wanted to share a little bit about the road that we traveled to get to where we are in the beginning of our Open Educational Resource Initiative. And so about 10 years ago, as I mentioned in my introduction, we started out with a reusable learning object initiative. And Alan Levine had developed a repository called the Maricopa Learning Exchange. And that really spurred this culture of sharing at the Maricopa Community Colleges. Um, faculty were really excited to share what they were using to teach, have others use it, use others materials. And so it was a very exciting time when we had the MLX and it was developing. And that just kind of lent itself to open educational resources. When phase one of the Next Gen Learning Challenges came out, we were really excited about the idea of starting out with open educational resources. But being such a large institution, it was really difficult for us to strategize with such, such a short turnaround time. And so what ended up happening was we ended up having pockets of innovation in regard to open educational resources across the district. We have psychology faculty, economic faculty, English, um, and math all doing different things at, other at all of our colleges, um, but we don't have anything strategic. Um, the most strategic OER initiative that we have so far within the Maricopa Community Colleges is Scottsdale Community College's math department um, took five of their courses and went completely open educational resources. They have a workbook um, that they've developed. They're using Math AS or WOMAP. And they are able to offer um, five of their courses, no matter who teaches it at SEC, it, using open educational resources, and they're saving students about $300,000 a year, which we're really excited about. But we really wanted to do something more strategic with our open educational resources here. So we put together a task force just last spring, and there were about seven people involved that we sat down um, and looked at what open educational resources were and what projects were being done across the nation and across the world. And our executive vice chancellor and provost um, put this task force together. So it's really interesting. Our open educational resources initiatives are supported at the top by our executive vice chancellor and provost and with a lot of interest from our governing board. And then we have pockets of innovation throughout the district that are gathering steam. And then we have students who want OER options. And so it's really just a perfect storm of support for our project. And so this task force got together. We looked at what was happening um, across the world. And we put together a proposal. And our proposal is called the Maricopa Millions. And our ultimate goal is to save students $5 million in five years across the district using open educational resources. And we had a number of objectives to meet this goal. And the first was to put together an OER steering team. And 
we started, well, our first meeting was just this August, and so we have done a tremendous amount of work in just a couple of months. It's just November now, so in three months. Um, we put together our steering committee, and our executive sponsor is our um, executive vice chancellor and provost. We have two presidents on our team. We have vice presidents and deans. We have instructional designers, faculty from a number of different disciplines. We have a librarian. We have our center for learning and instruction. We have IT representatives all on this team um, to support this initiative. And the first thing we did once we put that steering team together is we developed a strategic plan. And now we're basically working the plan. And that plan includes sharing of what OER is with our faculty, building awareness, putting together workshops, events, public service announcements, um, and also um, getting our faculty to start sharing. So our math departments, um, the, o the OER math faculty have been visiting other colleges within the district as well as within the state to share their success and what they've been doing um, and just really starting to build awareness of open educational resources. What's interesting is that there was a perception that OER was a math thing. And over time, we're, our faculty across the district are seeing, beginning to see, wow, this is far more than a math thing. This can apply to me, too. Um, one of our other goals is, of course, to develop standards and guidelines and policy. And so we have um, a number of things that we'd like to do in regard to this um, in terms of making recommendations um, for the possibility of Creative Commons licensing for internally funded projects, um, having a statement in our admin policy, um, and as um, Paul mentioned earlier, setting the default to open. I think that's just such a great phrase and something that we really can um, work towards. And so what we're really excited about is um, our pilot project. And so what we really want to do is get faculty using OER. And um, as James mentioned earlier, that one of the ideas is faculty incentives to adopt OER. And so that's what we're doing with our pilot project. We want to get faculty right out of the start line and working on adopting, um, remixing, and when necessary, developing open educational resources. And so we put, together, we put out a statement of interest for a call for proposals um, just a couple of weeks ago. And we were specifically asking for teams of three faculty representing three different Maricopa Community Colleges. We thought if we did that, we would be able to get greater adoption at the different colleges if we have faculty from the different schools working together. And we had over 30 um, teams submit statements of interest, which we're really excited about. And our call for proposals closes this Friday. So we can't wait to see what we get. Um, three of the courses that we're specifically targeting is our Psych 101, um, our English Composition, and our Developmental Reading. We're targeting high enrollment classes um, so that we can get the biggest bang for the buck in regard to developing the open resources and impacting the most students. Um, some of the other courses that we are considering with this call for proposals are communication, economics, chemistry, computer science, um, and our English 101 classes. So if you have any resources that you want to share with us, please email them to me with links and such so that we can share those with those who are applying for our grants. We specifically did not include math in the call for proposals because we have so much of math developed within the district. Um, so our timeline is that the call for proposals closes this Friday, and then we're going to evaluate them and have a quick turnaround time, bring all of those who are awarded um, fund funding for this together before the end of the semester, start training and developing in the spring, and pilot those courses in the fall. And what's really exciting is that we have a lot of faculty who um, are submitting proposals that are for entire departments. Um, so we're really excited about the impact that this could have. In addition, we're looking heavily at evaluating this. So we've been working very hard this semester to benchmark 
um, where we are. So we've been doing um, student focus groups of student perceptions of OER. Um, for those students who are using OER now, what is their satisfaction level? We've been surveying faculty for their awareness and their use of OER. And what was really interesting with that was we had faculty who were using OER and didn't know it. So we were pretty excited about that. And we're looking at really developing a longitudinal study since our project is $5 million over five years. We uh, want to definitely look at outcomes in regard to student success, faculty and student satisfaction, uh, and, and cost savings. And so we'll be really starting with that evaluation piece in the fall when we evaluate those pilot courses. Now, another of our goals is to make connections with other institutions. And we already started with that. So, for example, our call for proposals we modeled based on the VCCS proposal system that Richard Sebastian had put together. Um, we are very much into collaborating and working with others um, in terms of OER and, of course, in sharing whatever we are doing. We really feel that collaboration is key, whether it's internally within the colleges and the district, um, as well as externally with you. And so we really want to do whatever we can to work together um, to share everything that we're doing and learn from you all. I think that's really important. And finally, um, we do have a website under construction. Um, we will be posting our initial Maricopa Millions proposal as well as our strategic plan and identifying um, our, sa our, our savings for this fall. We have had a lot of um, interesting discussions as to what formula we should use for that. And um, many of you provided us with information um, on what you're doing through the CCC OER um, listserv. And we really appreciate that feedback. So we're just running those numbers now, and we're exciting, really excited to have this um, and be able to share the impact that we're making for our students. All right. Wow, Lisa, very exciting stuff. It seems as though you have all the right elements in place there. I'm sure that you will be contacted by many people on the webinar today asking for more information. Cable Green was kind enough to post links to uh, your website and some other documents associated with your project. So thanks, Cable, for that. And uh, yeah, just terrific stuff there going on in Maricopa. We really appreciate you uh, sharing that with us. Uh, now we're going to uh, hear from Quill about yet another uh, perspective on open policy, and that is specifically the role of students in uh, promoting OER. So Quill, take it away. Hi. Um, okay, so I am Quill West, just to remind you of who I am. I am the OER project director at Tacoma Community College. Um, and our OER project is slightly older. <laughs> we've been um, working on this project for about 18 months now. So uh, we've had a little bit more time to answer some of the ongoing questions. But I think um, it's really important to talk about how the students have been an advocate for our project because the TCC OER project was originally funded by students. So um, we're using student government funds in order to pay for the project in the first two years. Um, and so I think okay. it's important to talk about how the students found out about it. Um, and Una, if you would go ahead and play that clip. That was around the time where we weren't sure how tuition was going to be. Tuition was rising as a result of that issue and within the government about tuition increases. And so any little bit to help with the reduction of a cost I think really spoke to them. So you just heard the voice of E.J. Iglesias, who is um, on our student government. And he was a member of the student government leadership team when the OER project was first brought to them um, as a suggestion for funding. And it was right after they had um, had a rally at our state government saying that costs were getting too high. And they were concerned about tuition and fee costs, which are things that we don't necessarily have control over. But they also brought up textbook costs. And textbook costs are something that we have effect, current effective changeover. Because if we adopt OER, we immediately impact the cost for the students that are in those courses. And that's what the students were looking for at that time. And it's important, I think, to note that this group of students, of the group of students who um, initially pushed this 
uh, project through and initially said we want to fund this project. Most of them have already graduated without having any benefit from the OER project. They were looking at students in the future. And in fact, EJ is the only one who has had the, the um, joy of being able to take an OER class after doing all the work to get the project set up. Um, so this, the first start here is that the students felt like they were out there on their own on the cost issue. And we at TCC were able to um, get some immediate buy-in from the students by communicating that this is one of the ways that we can affect change in the cost of their education. Um, but of course, it's um, <laughs> the policies themselves around OER have focused on a lot of things. Um, we started with a pretty strong structure saying that we were going to assess our project as we went and affect long-term change. So the initial funding for this project was only two years. And we knew we were going to run some pilots in those two years. But during that pilot time, we wanted to begin to change the way we think about adopting resources at our institution. One of the big things that we're still working on but we're getting closer is now every time uh, a department is talking about adopting a textbook, we really want it to be the first step to be not, we need a new textbook, let's call the publisher, but we need a new textbook, let's start with OER and then go to the publishers if we have to. So um, that's one step that we're working towards, it gets closer all the time. Um, but as part of that structure, we've been doing a lot of assessment of the success of the cl classes that are using OER. We ask the students, do you like it? How does it change your learning? We ask the faculty, how does it change your teaching? Um, how does it change your experience? And we ask, um, then we look at retention and, um, and success data to make sure that the students are staying at least as successful as they do in the courses that use full textbooks. Um, so we're focusing on those structures and on the change that, on how the changes using OER affect our students and their learning because that's what we do here. We believe in teaching and learning at all colleges. Um, so we're working on that. Something else that we, that really matters in the assessment is that when we make a claim, we're trying to back it up. So um, we haven't had as big an effect, for example, in the policy areas around um, faculty development. We, um, many faculty who adopt OER want to be able to put it on their um, faculty professional development plans. And it makes sense, but we need to be able to tie OER back to some kind of development in order for that to work. We can't just say, yes, it's development to adopt OER. We have to explain how that happens. Otherwise, it cheapens the experience and it draws into question the whole development side of this. And then it's hard to tie it to promotion and tenure. So it's about, you know, being able to prove what we say when we say it. Um, something else that I think is important here from the student perspective is that um, we are affecting another level of policy in some of our classes that is at the classroom level. And when I say that, I mean that we are doing some work around teaching our students about their intellectual property rights and asking them to think about licensing their work in an open way. Um, and we started doing it mostly because um, we get these really incredible student papers or student projects and the teachers really like them and they get the student to say that they can share it with the next class and then they put it in a drawer or in a file or someplace and they only share it with their own students. But students at TCC do amazing work that we want to be able to share with a wider community and we want to be able to share it for a longer period of time. So we're asking our students to actually think about openly licensing their own work and to practice being a part of a community that shares so that we can share outside of the immediate class. And we've done that in many different ways. We've done it um, by inviting students to participate in a quarterly celebration of learning where we put their work up on a wall and do a mini student conference. We have done it through putting student work up on websites and things like YouTube. So we're trying to draw that into a bigger space because students create incredible work and we want to be able to share it. Um, however, that leads to one of the challenges that we face <laughs> and there will be challenges with open ed. Um, for example, um, we get all this great student work, They're, they openly license it. We don't have a real simple platform place for putting their work. We don't have like an institutional repository. So we need to find ways to share their work with a wider community. Um, 
we also face some like small minor changes. Paul earlier made a comment that he was looking for places where we can actually put in our catalog that this is an OER textbook free degree or class. Um, and we would love to be able to do that because as the students point out to us, they kind of chance into the OER courses. <laughs> so we've been trying to work on affecting institutional change so that we know early enough in the process before students start um, enrolling for their classes that they will be able to take an OER class so that they can plan, um, plan for their finances and those kinds of things in advance. Currently our system doesn't support that, but we're working on a new one and hopefully we'll be able to do that. Our, our kind of campus registration system doesn't support that. Uh, this is an example of how it doesn't always support it <laughs> um, as, er as early as last quarter uh, when students went to buy their textbooks and they went into our online bookstore to purchase their courses, to purchase their textbooks. If it was an open education course, they got this message. And it looks like the instructor never turned in a book order. And uh, that's not actually true. What happened is the instructor turned in a book order that said, I'm not using a textbook in this class. And our bookstore, because we weren't communicating very well, didn't have a way to say, this is an OER class, not a, this is a class we're waiting for the book order on. And so the students were often told in our bookstore, wait for a week and your teacher may get the book order in and then we'll get the book for you. Uh, so it caused a lot of confusion. Um, we have started to make inroads on changing that. So now uh, the top thing on this slide is a student book, is a book order from a faculty member that's not filled in. But you can see they now have a drop down where they can actually choose this is an OER course and there's no book needed. And then the, the student gets a message that says no text course, which isn't perfect, but it's a lot closer. And because we have to publish this book, it's book purchase information early, sometimes students are able to figure out which classes have no textbooks based on what the bookstore says when they go to register for classes. So it's a little bit closer. It's not the 100% answer. We're working on it, but we are getting closer. Um, so <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about collaboration and how we're doing that. And I think it's important that we collaborate amongst different projects, but also that we collaborate with one another at our institution. So I learned early in this process that the Seattle Community Colleges do a day they call the sharing day. And it's really about being able to share with people in your environment, just like across the hall even. <laughs> um, what I have found with our OER policy is that it's very, very relational as people adopt and talk amongst each other, the adoptions grow. Um, so being able to affect change with your colleagues matters quite a bit in our OER project. Beyond that, being able to talk to people at other institutions who might adopt the same piece adds a lot of value to our faculty's experience. So we, we're trying to build that level of collaboration into our OER policy as we go. Um, and then I want to finish, I actually want to finish because I still think the student voice is the most important voice in this conversation. It, the students um, are the ones who tell their faculty members how expensive books are. They're the ones who tell them how much they appreciate when they're using materials that aren't traditional textbooks. Um, and they're the ones who have the strongest voice about this. So I'm actually going to turn back to uh, to EJ's voice quickly so that you can hear what I think a chance for students to access higher education easier. That's going to be the biggest thing I can think when it comes to OER. It's that piece of the puzzle that makes it more accessible, not just the material, but being able to go to college. I'm just going to end on EJ's voice, so thank you. That's great, Quill. Thank you. Yeah, just being able to go to college. That's absolutely right. Um, great. We're going to turn to questions and answers here in just a second, but I want to remind everyone of the next CCC OER webinar coming up on December 11th at 11 a.m. Pacific. For those of you who are used to the 12 noon time, do note the 11 uh, o'clock start time. Uh, we will be hearing from Barbara Olofsky and uh, Cable Green, who both of whom are with us uh, today on California Community Colleges sharing it forward with a CC by license. Very exciting stuff here in California. And uh, uh, California Community Colleges, for those of you who don't know, uh, comprise 112 community colleges serving 2.6 million students, largest uh, single higher educational system in the world. So for California Community Colleges to uh, adopt a 
an open policy is a big deal. So uh, Cable and Barbara are going to tell us about that policy and hopefully their work, tell us about their work on that as well. They were instrumental in uh, making that opportunity uh, come to a reality. So with that, let's see if we have any questions out there. You can uh, hit star 6 to unmute yourself or you can post a question in the chat box. Runa, do we have any questions from the chat? We do. Um, one of the earlier ones was posted by Ryan and this was addressed to Lisa. And Ryan asked, what were the criteria in the call for proposals for um, OER in the Maricopa District? Um, we have the full rubric available on our website at maricopa.edu slash OER. And we also have a downloadable version of the questions for the proposal. Um, so it's all available um, for anyone to look at or use. Wonderful. Um, and um, let's see, uh, there was a question for you, Quill, from David. Um, and he, uh, David asked if there were any options for having a printed copy of the OER text available via on-demand printing through the bookstore? Yes. <laughs> um, so it depends on the, the materials that the faculty member adopts. But if it is something that can be easily printed as a textbook, then yes, we have the on-demand options if, if the faculty <coughs> member chooses it. And, and I'm going to add to that uh, just a request, and that is if, if you uh, know of colleges where that is an option, I think it would be very interesting for other colleges to learn about that. So please uh, email me and Una uh, if you are, are at a college or aware of a college that does offer that print on demand option. I, that's a question that comes up uh, quite often. So I think it would be great if we could collect that information and share it out. Thank you. Any other questions out there from the chat? Or audio questions? All right. Well, it seems as though uh, our speakers, Paul and Lisa and Quill, have done a very thorough job of, of uh, sharing their projects and uh, addressing questions along the way. So I want to once again thank Paul and Lisa and Quill and all of their collaborators at Creative Commons at uh, the Maricopa Community College District and at Tacoma Community College for the great work that they're doing and uh, really showing us the way uh, forward in uh, adopting open policies, not only uh, doing it on the ground, but uh, also including students and uh, providing examples uh, of uh, state and national and international policies that uh, will help us move, move things forward for our students. So thank you to everyone. Please remember the next webinar on December 11th, again at 11 a.m with Cable Green and Barbara Ilofsky talking about the CC by license recently adopted by the California Community Colleges. And with that, we'll say thank you very much and uh, have a great day.